Hey everyone, this is Shubham from the Anti-Cancer Project and today we have here with us Ms. Anne Fonfa who has an amazing thriving story to share. So Ms. Anne was diagnosed with breast cancer in her late 90s but she refused medical treatments, she refused chemotherapy and went ahead to heal her cancer naturally by changing her diet and changing her lifestyle. And today has been I think more than 25 years or so and she is still thriving and cancer free. How exciting is that? Not just that, but she has been a major driving force in the natural healing community and is also the founder of the Annie Appleseed Project, which we'll talk about in great detail in this video. So hello, Miss Anne, how are you? Thank you so much for doing this. Thank you very much for having me. I'm well this morning, beautiful day here in South Florida. Hey. <laughs> The weather is pretty good here as well. So, thank you so much again. <laughs> so, uh, why don't we start with your story? I mean, how uh, did you get diagnosed with cancer? I mean, what's uh, what happened and can you just, can we start with that? Sure. You know, in, um, in December of 1992, I felt a lump in my left breast. Um, I was doing self-exam monthly like most women ought to. And I always had a lump in the right breast, but I never thought anything of it. And then um, I have a friend who became an acupuncturist. So I said to her, hey, you know, I got this lump in the left side. And she said, you should see a doctor. And so I went to where I got a normal mammogram. I'd had at least one prior. I was not quite 45 years old. And um, they went crazy. They said, oh, you know, we have to send you to a surgeon right away. So the thing is, I was suffering from very serious multiple chemical sensitivity. And that meant that every time I smelled cleaning products or people's fragrances, that cologne or hairspray, I would get very ill. I'd have a headache the last three days or so. I'd have to be in bed. It was a very debilitating situation. So with breast cancer, as some of your listeners may know, there's no real pain necessarily. And I didn't have any desperation feeling. So when I went to the surgeon, uh, I didn't even know you could pick your own doctor, which is a thing here. And so I went along with everything that he said. And he said lumpectomy. And he said, we'll probably do radiation. And I was thinking in my head, I don't think radiation's for me. But I had the surgery. But also, they told me on a Thursday, that was the visit, that Monday there'd be a surgery opening. In the U.S., we think surgery takes a while. So I was thinking, oh, this is bad cancer. I'm, I'm in bad shape. Well, it turned out the diagnosis was stage one of uh, lobular cancer, which is not a, a, the mainstream cancer. Usually it's ductal, and I had lobular. About 15% is lobular. Doesn't show up on mammograms. So when I presented with the lump, they really didn't know what was going on. And this doctor did not do a biopsy. But again, I didn't know anything, so I didn't know a biopsy was an important step for determining what was going on. And it was prior to the internet in 19, January of 1993. Yeah. So... Um, I had the surgery, and when I woke up, the doctor was standing by, and he said to me, oh, I have very good news for you. None of the lymph nodes had cancer. So I, I didn't know what that was. I, I don't think I'd ever heard of lymph nodes at that point. And so he explains to me, oh, we took uh, 18 lymph nodes. They're all negative, meaning no cancer. And, um, you know, this is now we know what kind of chemotherapy to offer you. So then I was really upset because, A, he never mentioned it to me, and B, I'd had an injury to my left arm. So I developed lymphedema, which you're, some of you people may know. It's a swelling of the lymphatic system. It's not regular swelling. And it happened right away. So to this day, and it's now, it'll be 30 years in January since my diagnosis, I still have a swollen left arm. But it never became terrible because I controlled it with the same thing that controlled the cancer. As you mentioned, I used lifestyle. I changed my diet. I had been a, a vegetarian, but not really a healthy one. You know, it's possible to eat junk food as a vegetarian. And I was more or less, I'd have cake, you know, I'd have potato chips, things I shouldn't have had, but I wasn't thinking about it. I didn't expect to get cancer, clearly. So I made those changes and I became a vegan over a period of time, giving up dairy. And um, that was the only real thing that I was doing that wasn't vegan. And also I decided to be 100% or as much as possible organic. But that wasn't terribly easy to do, but it wasn't impossible. And prior, in the 10 years prior to the diagnosis, I traveled a lot for business. And it was impossible to be a vegetarian and travel. I mean, I would, 
not like India where a lot of people are vegetarian. You know, you can yeah. walk in a restaurant and yeah. say veg and everybody, yeah, we know what you mean. I'd go into a restaurant and I'd say, well, you know, could I have a plate of vegetables? And they were like, what? I said, well, I see you're offering a leg of lamb with asparagus. Just hold the, the lamb and give me the asparagus, right. you know, give me the broccoli and let me have some carrots. And, and I'd have to make a plate by actually literally going piece by piece down their menu. It was weird. But, you know, I survived that. And then I would be having like a fast food hamburger joint with, mm. with my coworkers while traveling, but not having the hamburger. And I thought that was cool. I had everything else. It was all junk food. So it wasn't great. And I switched that. I also began exercising really seriously. I've, I always exercised from the time I was in my 20s, thanks to my brother, who was a champion athlete. He urged me to do it. But it was not, you know, it wasn't a serious part of my life. So then I started walking, riding a stationary bike, and I would do the stationary bike for an hour. And somewhere along the line, I developed the idea that you need to do it from 3 to 4 a.m. to impact the liver. So I was getting up at 3 a.m. and riding my bicycle, stationary bicycle, in the house for an hour. I don't know. But there were a lot of things that, you know, and then I learned about dietary supplements. And, um, and I, I was in a support group with people who were going through chemotherapy and radiation. And they were becoming very ill. And I was becoming healthier. And they could see it. And I could see it. So some of the women started saying to me, well, tell me what you're doing. What are you eating? Can I drink your juice? I was making juicing. I was juicing during that time. And um, so they started joining me. And so I started a group to talk about the things I was doing with other people. And it became a real, a real organization eventually, as you mentioned, it became the Annie Appleseed Project because I was writing notes about each meeting and I would keep track and I eventually got a website and posted it. Mm. But I was benefiting tremendously by searching out information for everyone else and myself. And so, um, but then, you know, I started to have recurrences and I had quite a lot. So one thing they say about radiation, and people should realize, it does not save your life. What it can do is reduce the local tumors within the area. So in this case, within the breast. But I didn't care about that because radiation, I had a large breast and my entire left side upper body was in the field. And the doctor saying, you know, we'll do this, we'll do that. And I say, my heart, my left lung, I, I, it doesn't sound like a good idea. And then. Uh, so I didn't, you know, I didn't do that either. I didn't do the chemo. I didn't do that. Lots of reasons for not doing chemo, not just the sensitivity that I mentioned, the chemical sensitivity. But a couple of years before that, my uncle was diagnosed with a brain tumor, which had been uh, lung cancer. The lung cleared up, went to the brain. That's a common thing. So I was in charge for no reason. You know, it was two years before I got cancer, so I didn't know anything about it. But I, in the family, I'm in charge. So... <laughs> The doc say to me, if we don't give him chemo and radiation, he's going to die in three months. I was like, oh, yeah, we got to do that. So we jump on chemo and radiation, and three weeks later, he dies. Three weeks. So I go to the doctors, and I'm like, what happened? Doc said, we didn't promise anything. So this leads to one important idea that we, the patients here, we're going to take care of you, and you'll be cured. And docs are saying, well, we'll treat you, you know, with no guarantee at all, and in general, no guarantee at all. So... That was a, a lesson for me. So by the time my own diagnosis came, I was clearly not ready to do chemo. And the interesting thing was I went to visit an oncologist because that's what you do. And the oncologist says to me, oh, we'll start chemo next week. And I say, doc, I have a problem. And he says, oh, it doesn't matter. <laughs> I was like, wait, it matters to me. I'm passing out when I smell <laughs> things I'm out of bed. And, and he goes, oh, that doesn't matter. So how could I work with him? You know, so I said to myself, well, I'm leaving in a minute or two. And I left and I never went back. And that's, you know, but it worked out for me. And and that was, but I, you know, I had to work at it. I mean, you can't just sit back and say, well, I won't do that. You have to do something. And, and that's what both of our projects are about. What else can you do? So I began to gather the evidence. And in the U.S., we have this thing about evidence. It has to be a randomized clinical trial, which means right. a right. lot of different hospitals participate. And it's a big plus a lot of money in the U.S. I mean, a ridiculous amount of money. The only people who can afford it, pharmaceutical industry. So they don't look at natural stuff. That's not their thing. So when I here I was doing this nutritional program and exercise program, and I'm a happy person, so I wasn't really fearful. I, I never thought I would die from it. I just didn't. After the first day, I felt okay. So I would go to meetings and talk to the people in the pharmaceutical company, and i say, I have a great idea. Let's do a clinical trial where everybody eats healthier. Everybody takes a walk before and after treatment. And they're like, 
man, we can't patent that. <laughs> you know, number one thing is what they can patent and make money on. Fine, we want to make money, but you shouldn't rule the whole the whole protocol. And that's what happens, you know, and, and they teach the doctors or have taught the doctors. It's changing uh, here, at least, um, you know, it's nothing else. You have to do chemo, you have to do radiation. So another issue that troubled me, they would say, well, it was the drug was well tolerated. And I say, for whom? <laughs> no. Who felt okay about the harms of treatment, conventional treatment? And that's a problem. So I started to focus on what became called integrative oncology. But there were a lot of things that worked to reduce the toxicity. And exercise, of course, is one. And they were, docs at that time were saying, well, just eat whatever you want, have ice cream, you need to keep your weight up. You know, That was all nonsensical. Mm -hmm. And uh, they didn't connect the dots. So at the same time as the, the PET scan was developed, I don't know if you have that probably do in some centers in India. So the PET scan, they give you an injection of a radioactive dye, but it's got right. sugar in it. Mm -hmm. So it'll right. go to the cancer right. cells. Obviously, sugar in cancer cells, not a great idea. So there's now right. some research that actually says that, that wait, maybe we should be reducing sugar intake. Mm -hmm. But years ago, and even now, some docs are still saying it doesn't matter, but it matters a lot. And in, in every way, there were studies that were focused on other aspects where they can tease out the fact that People with triple negative breast cancer, the breast cancer least treatable with conventional medicine, benefits from what you eat or don't eat, how physically active you are or not, and everybody benefits from how you handle stress. So lots of different ways. And in the U.S., we copy yoga. As I mentioned to you the other day, we don't do yeah. yoga the way you all do yoga, but we throw in a move here and a move there, and you know it's not bad. And many people who take a yoga class for an hour feel really good, really refreshed. Uh, you know, really benefit. And that's become a thing. So back in the day, when I um, was first diagnosed, I was involved with this group in New York City called Share, And they had a yoga teacher, and she taught the classes. But the doc said to me, yoga, are you trying to kill yourself? That's what they knew. That'd be nothing, you know, zero, nothing. Nice. And <laughs> <it's government. laughs> Anyway, but you know, it's pretty uh, common here in India. I mean, every third person you'll find doing yoga and there are like hundreds and thousands of classes going on at the same time. <laughs> well, I think it's a really, it's really important because um, how you feel about things, you know, mm -hmm. matters a lot. So, like I said, I didn't think I was going to die of breast cancer. I just had in my mind, not going to be an issue. And of course, you know, at 44, it's very hard to think about dying. And it just, it didn't seem like me. And, and that's the, the, what I continued with all along. And I said to people, everything I'm doing is like a step toward getting healthier. Because I didn't know what I was doing. There was no way to track my own. So, you know, I'd say every step brings me closer to being healthier all the time. And I continue with that to this day. And I got on protocols. I do a coffee enema in the morning. I started that in 1995 when I experienced the first recurrence in the, in the breast, which I still had. So after a while, I ended up, I had three lumpectomies and then I had a mastectomy on the left side. And then I got tumors on the chest wall and two different doctors tell me I now I have stage four disease. And I say, so when why was, did I, I mean, just, just, just wanted to know about, I mean, when did the, I mean, so earlier when, when you were first diagnosed, then, then it was just, uh, I mean, what, what stage was it? And then it progressed. Yeah, so originally stage one in January of 93, and then when I had okay. a two-year follow-up in January of 95, I had more tumors, and I knew it, and I went in and had a lumpectomy, and under the um, tumor that I felt, which was in the exact spot as the first one, very common, it, it, despite the surgeon telling me up front, oh, we got everything, we got it all, so they say that, but it doesn't mean a thing, because you can't tell, you know, we don't have equipment that sees every single cancer cell, it's ridiculous, but I didn't know that. Anyway, and underneath that was a second tumor. It didn't show up in the mammogram because, again, type of cancer I had lobular doesn't mm. show up on mammograms. So uh, um, now, after the third lumpectomy, which was other tumors in a different area, I had a mastectomy. And then the tumors show up on the chest wall, which is actually breast tissue, which looks just like tissue tissue, so you can't tell. Mm. And the docs, two docs tell me that I now have stage four. This is 1997 years of tumors and so i say to them why did i have a mastectomy if now it's worse you know i didn't get that yeah. but yeah. they don't know either you know it was, it was an unfortunate but but i was again i wasn't sick i didn't feel ill i felt well i was still on my protocol and so um 
I tried a lot of different things. I was doing high dose vitamin A protocol that I had found out oh. because, you know, I, I explored a lot of stuff. I lived in New York City, uh, you know, like you, a big city like Delhi. And there's so much going on. And I found the things I found doctors, I found protocols, I found ideas, and I just filter them through my idea of what I should be doing. You know, I'm very, very self-motivated. And so I found this protocol and I was doing high dose vitamin A. I didn't have really any of the things they say could go wrong. You know, a little skin irritation, but not much else. And some tumors disappeared. And I was like, yeah, I got it. And then some more appeared. <laughs> so then I tried this um, maitake mushroom extract. So mushrooms, mm -hmm. as you probably know, very yeah. successful yeah. in dealing with, with health right. and cancer. Right. So then more tumors disappeared, but I got more. So in 1998, after many years of, of tumors, uh, I had at that point, I think maybe 23 tumors overall. I had nine in the breast and then on the chest wall. Yeah, a lot. I'm the tumor queen of the U.S. for sure. Oh. And then <laughs> I was at the San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium and I met a Chinese herbalist who now is a wonderful friend of mine. And he said to me, I think I can help you. And I started doing Chinese herbs in April of the next year, because at that time I had my 25th tumor overall. And I said, that's it, I can't take it anymore. And I did the herbs, I had a tremendous reaction. Every inch of my body became a hive. I mean, I was covered head to toe in hives, raised hives on my arms and legs. And I was horrified, oh no, what's going on now? But within a couple of days, three days, the, um, the tumors, the uh, hives went away, but also my chemical sensitivity changed, which was amazing. The, the symptoms change, I call that objective. And subjectively, I wrote in my diary, I feel 65% better, you know, already. I wasn't oh, responding oh. like that. And I was having like two days of headache. You know, I used to have two or three days of a headache. Now I had a few minutes, maybe 10 minutes, but it went away. So I was much better, you know, so now I was happy to have a real life. And over time, the tumors began to stop occurring. And the ones I had were cleared up. And in 14 months, in 10 months, the herbalist said, oh, you can stop taking the herbs. And I said, you know, after all these years, I can't stop yet. So I took him for four more months. And then he said to me, no, you got to stop. You know, So I stopped. I had an MRI. And I had an MRI in the beginning because I had something to prove. And at the end, and it showed that I had no more cancer, as noticed in, a, you know, in an MRI. Again, nothing's perfect in the kind of screening test that we have. So you can never be 100%. So you have to count on the rest of your efforts killing tiny amounts right. of cancer cells. Right. So that's what the lifestyle is about. Uh, healthy behavior, the dietary supplements, detox, um, you know, your mind. Mm. Very Mindset. important. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Very important. Yeah. Always yeah. I said to myself, I'm not dying from this. I'm, you know, I'm just going to live. No, the and, mindset and, is, I mean, the, probably the most important part in the complete, uh, you know, the complete protocol. Because until unless your mind is in the right place, your, your entire protocol, I think it depends on that only. So, yeah, I, yeah. mindset, yeah. So one of the things that I developed, the idea is, you know, they say like even the worst cancer, organ cancers, you know, 10% survival over uh, five years. And I say to people, put yourself in the survivor category. Why wouldn't you? You know what? Don't make your mind go and oh no, I'm going to die. Put yourself in the I'm a survivor category because some people survive and it may as well be you. And of course, you have to actively pursue mm -hmm. the things that make you happy and, and keep you lively. And, you know, it's the things we talked about, the healthy diet, the exercise, right. right. de-stress, detox, dietary supplements, whatever you can manage. And there's so many paths to wellness. One of my favorite things to say, many paths to wellness. So like people have said to me, oh, I, I can't, I'm allergic to this. Okay. okay, well, don't do that because there's a lot of other ways. There's homeopathy, mm -hmm. there's, yeah. there's Chinese herbal medicine, you know, there's Western herbs. There's so many yeah. things you can do. And as long as you're willing to keep trying, and again, everything that I do contributes to the next step of my health. Right. Now, in, in all, um, oddly enough, in January of 2019, I had a lump in my left groin, and I didn't think much of it because, but I went to, um, uh, I forget, anyway, I had, a, I think, a gynecologist, and I had a um, biopsy, and it turned out that it was follicular lymphoma, which is a cancer that develops from chemical sensitivity. So I didn't expect that, but, you know, I had this diagnosis. So that's four years ago now. And again, you know, it, it's about survival. It's about living. I am living well right this minute. So I've already, I'm about to survive in January. 
30 years for breast cancer and four years for follicular lymphoma. So I don't care, you know, it's yeah. going strong. Yeah. And my and life's you're, work you're is- You're extremely, so extremely positive, you know, extremely, uh, you know, energetic. That's, that's one of the best things about you. I, I think so too. And I can uplift other people I have for years and years and years. You know, people call me, I'm dying of cancer. I go, no, wait, plenty of time to be dead. There's eons, but you're living now. Focus on that. And I think that helps people because we have to focus. You know, this is your life. Mm -hmm. There's no guarantee. I mean, people die in a car accident. <laughs> you know, we don't think any we, people die of cancer. But you don't have to. If you focus, focus on living, that's your life. There's no guarantee for anybody, you know. And nowadays they're saying that up to... Uh, one in three American women will develop cancer and one in two American men. That's a, it's hideous, that hideous. Yeah. yeah, it's crazy. And also, of course, we have a huge diabetes problem. And now there's new evidence that people with diabetes do worse, have worse outcomes. Mm -hmm. And it's yeah. spreading all over the world because junk food is everywhere. I, I told you that I was in India in 2006 and there was starting to be junk Indian food restaurants, mm -hmm. you know, with old oil and old. Yeah, it's horrible. So the cheapest kind of food, it's not a great yeah. idea. And, and it's very difficult. Um, diabetes, we don't have cure for diabetes, just like we don't have a cure or cures for cancer. We have treatment. But the treatment for diabetes, like the treatment for cancer, it doesn't stop the progression of the disease for most people, which is pretty crappy. So, you know, we really have to head it off at the pass and, and try and live a healthier lifestyle regardless. Even if you don't have cancer, start now. I tell people who are, you know, especially women, they run the household. And I say, make sure everyone in your house is eating the healthy food that you're eating. Don't just take it for yourself and let them have a hamburger and a hot dog every day. Mm -hmm. Very American, you know. We have the worst eating habits in the U.S. It's incredible. Mm -hmm. Packaged food, processed food, artificial color, artificial flavor, preservatives. I don't eat anything like that. I haven't had artificial color, flavor, or preservative in 40 years, and I don't intend to ever have it again. Just, Yeah. And yet, you know, people say, and yet you've got cancer. So I say also the environment, a lot of chemicals, a lot of things going on in our world that cause trouble. And I will say, and I don't know if this is okay to say to your audience, but I had digestive issues all of my life, starting from mm. infancy. Mm. I was a colicky baby. I had um, problems with my digestion all through my youth, my teen years. I even went to the doctor about it. Doctor said, oh, it's normal for you, dear. You can go twice a week. Can you imagine that? I was having twice a week movement and I knew I didn't feel good. It wasn't good. Nobody supported that. You know, they're saying, oh, it's normal. It's your nerves, you know, your nerves. No. So why am I, yeah. I don't have nerves. I'm not like that. Anyway, so when I got breast cancer, that the circulating estrogen, too much estrogen is the cause of breast cancer, one of the causes. Mm -hmm. So that's, you know, for me, that was clearly involved. And so I put a lot of effort into trying to change that finally, because my friend was an acupuncturist. I had access to information and I was really working on it and still took years, years to get normalized, you know, and that, so it, that's another problem that we have worldwide. There's a lot of constipation on our website. We have these handouts that try to help people. If people are doing conventional treatment, we have a handout on reducing the treatment toxicity because the pain and suffering is not helpful. It's the opposite. It's terrible. We have a handout on what to, how to eat healthy, how to be active, how to handle stress. We have a handout on constipation because so many people are dealing with that. And so, you know, we're trying to gather the evidence and information for things also that people have tried. And I used to say, if it worked for somebody, it could work for other people. There's no real reason, you know, and things that work for me, I'm not special. I'm not, I'm a regular human being. Therefore, those kind of things could work for other people. And in fact, they have, you know, simple things like <clears throat> I had a, um, catheter at one point for IV vitamin C drip and it um, scarred and I couldn't my my right arm so I had lymphedema on the left side with a somewhat damaged arm although it's pretty good relatively speaking and then here's this thing going on in my right arm and I, because of the scar tissue so I found on uh, September 1st of whatever year it was I don't remember I started using cocoa butter of course, I used organic cocoa butter, rubbing it into the location. And within three months, the scar tissue completely dissolved underneath my skin. So then I was—I put that on the website. I say to people, hey, if you have a scar that's troubling, it doesn't take the scar away, but it takes away the scar tissue. 
And you may know that a lot of times docs say, well, we'll do a surgery. We'll remove all the scar tissue. Yeah. Well, then what happens? Yeah. You have in a few more years, you have more scar tissue because you had surgery. So now we say to people, there's a simple thing. Just put some cocoa butter on it. Three right. months later, it's done. I mean, these simple things are part of the natural world and we should all know about them. So that's another thing that our website offers is simple, natural things that make it easier to function. That's important, you know. So, I mean, if we we'll, if we summarize uh, Apple any seed, pro any Apple seed project, so how how can we summarize it in like two words or uh, two sentences or three sentences so that, you know, the people of India can, you know, just just gain an understanding about this uh, project? So it's primarily evidence-based information about complementary medicine to go along with conventional medicine, lifestyle changes and issues, and holistic approaches, including everything else. In addition to that, the goal of it is to help people make better decisions about their what they should be doing. And that's, I mean, that's really important. And part of it is, um, where else are they getting that information? You know, your website's a source as well. It's really important because mainstream has not caught up. Some docs, yeah, they, but they get penalized if they step outside the code. So they have to be really careful of what they say and do. And some of them happily say, yes, it matters what you eat, see a nutritionist. But you can't even guarantee that your nutritionist is going to be up to date. I mean, mm. I recently had a problem with uh, high calcium, and I was told to go to the emergency room. I went to the emergency room, and they put me in the hospital. And, you know, after a while, you're like on a train, and you can't get off. So they tell me, oh, we have organic tofu. You can have that. So I said, okay, I'll have that for lunch and dinner, every meal. But then it turned out they were adding sugar to it for a sauce. So I called the nutritionist and she came to my room, the head nutritionist. And I said, you know, th this is crazy. I have cancer. You're giving me sugar. Don't do that. So then she said, oh, you know, we have salad. I said, oh, great. I'll have salad. So you know what arrived in my room? And I'm not kidding. A bowl of iceberg lettuce. You know iceberg lettuce? It's got no nutrients. It's the most yeah, nothing. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So just this was it. One, just iceberg lettuce in a bowl. So then I call her back and she comes and I said, why don't you put some cucumbers in or some red onions? Or And she says, oh, that's such a good idea. So I'm telling the nutritionist to put, how, how is that okay? How is that nutrition? And she's in charge of the hospital nutrition. I mean, <laughs> you know, so <laughs> that's why we have our project because people still need a lot of help. Yeah. Really yeah. So it's basically, it, uh, it invites all the, I mean, people who are looking to gain information on, I mean, experts who are looking to gain information on, on natural healing or, I mean, should I say, on alternative ways? Yeah. So one of the things in the, in the conventional world, everything is about the type of cancer and they have a drug specific yeah. for cancer. In the natural world, it's much more holistic. So exactly. it, you and I can have three different kinds of cancers. It doesn't matter. The treatment could be the same. It could be homeopathy. You might get some different items, but you're using homeopathy. Chinese medicine, they give you a personalized prescription of herbs that you make into a tea. It's your prescription, you know, and so on. But it's not specifically for the type of cancer in the in the way that conventional medicine is. So it's a much, much more, more um, you know, it's a wider range of possibilities. Right. Acupuncture, keeping up your system. Um, you know, uh, exercise, massage, um, yoga. There's things that everyone can do that are enhancing, and we try to cover everything. Plus, alternatives that have been absolutely pushed aside in the U.S., like hydrazine sulfate, mm -hmm. IV vitamin C, uh, laetrile. You know, there's just a lot of things that, and and I know, uh, I know the backstory of a lot of these items because I've been around for 30 years, and some of the people who created these techniques. Are, were still alive when I began, and I met them because I was trying to meet everybody and get them to speak at my group in New York and, you know, and make a difference. So I know that some of these things truly worked, but the way that the studies were conducted made it sound like they didn't via view from the conventional view. But you can look things over yeah, and say, wait. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's, I mean, I'm, I'm just saying that's really sad to, you know, to know this, that uh, despite all of this, people are not able to understand that uh, the natural path and the natural healing actually works for them, could work for them. And, you know, uh, it's so ironic that uh, uh, despite having all these things, people are still, you know, looking for the traditional ways and trying to understand what, what better drugs can be used to kill our cells. 
so that is somewhere it's not a right approach or even it is it, it doesn't work then it becomes a very big problem for them also well yeah you know one of the things again i've 30 years i've seen a lot of things so what i think is if you do complementary medicine it reduces the harms otherwise if you're taking in conventional medicine you get chemo and then you become resistant to it and you need a different chemotherapy and you become resistant to that but each time you're having the harms from that treatment and it yeah. takes down your body and your mind and your spirit you have to keep it up oh, that's what complementary medicine is support for people going through but in the end you just weaken 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 when you need strengthening and so it's not my primary thing but i don't tell people what not to do i tell people what else to do because i think binding things is a is the best way a little of this a little of that you know but i'm not a fan of conventional medicine but it isn't my place to tell you not to do it if right. you choose right. and they do scare you most people are scared and the docs are very scary sometimes and they say you're going to die or the worst thing at all the worst thing is you have 2 years to live like, what yeah. <laughs> you can't say that it's ridiculous you know the uh, the doc who treats my lymphoma has said to me several times when we meet oh you know you're not in remission and i said to her that's not your opening sentence i'm sorry okay. your opening yeah. sentence how do you feel i feel good thank you, you know, thanks for asking. i mean really it's just wrong and they crush your spirit it's not a good idea you know and you may want to say i mean i think everyone should have a will and should arrange their affairs so that they right. know you know everybody knows what's going to happen we all die i mean you're not going to escape death <laughs> that that's not happening mm. eventually you will die so making a plan is okay but you don't have to be scared to do it you don't have to be scared so hard that you know you people die on command i mean that's a really big issue doc says you have 3 months to live most people die in 3 months i mean they really do and it's a terrible thing so you have to be strong and you have to be right. um focused and you have to focus on life and right now we're alive everything's good beautiful day you know whatever it is we have a beautiful evening you know whatever it is i mean that's an important thing you just right be yeah. happy be happy find the happiness you know, i mean i tell people small things can make you happy it doesn't have to be gigantic you know yesterday i was walking in um a nature preserve that we have right near my house how lucky is that and somebody uh, this family was there a mother um and grandmother and a little baby in a carriage i love little babies so as we're walking up they're coming this way and i see the baby's face and i'm smiling and i'm waving and i'm i'm like happy to see the baby because why not you know i took the joy in the moment and the grandmother said to me he's a very happy baby and i said i can see that you know and it made me happy it made her happy that i could see it why not you know why not so uh, i see great birds at the sanctuary i saw um, incredible iguanas you know and By the way, in South Florida where I live, we have the same plants that I saw all over India. Only your plants just oh, grow and grow oh. and grow and ours they chop down all the yeah. time. Yeah. You have really large wonderful plants and we have chopped down whatever. <laughs> But yeah, I little thing. I think you should have been born in India because you <laughs> I think you you you're born in the wrong place because you you just you have used all the things from India for the past 30 and I think more than 30 years. So <laughs> you know oh, that's also, that, that is food. very ironic also or you had a you had a different mission probably you 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 took all the things from India and you are starting a mission here in the US so that sounds a fun mission too <laughs> I came to India in 2006 I went to like six different areas and um I had five women with me I gave a talk to to a, a group I visited various patient groups I had a great mm-hmm. time and Indian food top favorite food I just had it um Thursday I love it I have it every week if if you know one of my oh, dreams is yeah. that next door to me moves an Indian chef and I give her all of my organic fruits and vegetables and she makes me food and I'll pay her you know oh, fine oh, with yeah. that but I would be because you know it's not organic but I ordered a bindi and I it was delish I mean really good and I had it again yeah. last night for dinner so it was fantastic I mean really yeah. anyway aside from everything but <laughs> that sounds great So uh so I I have another question so uh it was in 9293 right so uh when did you start your uh, dietary protocol i mean it was it was in 93 only because uh you said that it it started metastasizing so your life i mean your dietary uh, things that you changed your diet and everything was uh, from 93 only or you were doing it from the beginning or before that or how was it yeah 
so around uh, in, in 93, I, I stopped eating junk food. You know, I had no more cake and no okay. more chips. But in 95, when I had the first uh, recurrence, was when I became a vegan and organic all the way. All right. Before that, I was eating out, you know, and, and doing, but now I stopped doing that and I just focus on organic. And when I went places, I brought my own food. Well, I would make up a, a right. you know, a vegetable thing and bring it with me, no matter where I was, including friends' houses, because people didn't know how to mm. feed a, veg a vegan, you know. So I brought my own mm. food. I was fine with that. And and that was a very important part of, of my mission. But, you know, most of all, mm. the doctors who told me I had stage four disease didn't do any tests at all. They based it on the mm. fact that I had chest wall recurrence. So I was determined, determined to show that that was wrong. And I even said to them up front, you know, I don't know who you're talking to. You're not talking to me. And I pushed it away physically, mentally. I thought it was not so. And maybe it was stage four, but it isn't now. You know, I, yeah. I, I don't know. I don't know how to, you know, it, it was there were a lot of mistakes. And I think a lot of mistakes happen in in medicine. That's very problematic. But more than anything, I just had a belief. You know, there's a group in the U.S., I don't know if you've heard of it, called Radical Remission. And yeah. uh, the, the person who created it, Kelly Turner, she'll be speaking at our conference. And she taught, you know, that, that people who have survival, no matter what, have certain aspects. And the part, most important one is always what you're thinking, what you're thinking. Right. I mean, it's not only the only thing, but it's an important aspect. Because if you're into pain and suffering, where's it going? Where's your life? Right now is the time to be looking for the joy in your life for everybody. And, and there's always yeah. something, always something, you know. And how, I mean, uh, how was it? I mean, did you have, did you do a lot of juicing and did you do a lot of, uh, yeah. uh, I mean, you had salads. How, how was your diet? So I, I went to Mexico to a clinic that did the Gerson therapy. And people can look okay. that up, the Gerson therapy. It involves a lot of 13 juices a day, um, no salt for six weeks, um, uh, a variety of, you know, and of course, vegan food, hmm. organic, and other things that um, iodine and so on. I, hmm. Iodine is very important. And a lot of people are missing that, particularly if you don't eat right. fish, which of course I don't. So uh, I eat seaweed. And and um, I followed that protocol for 18 months. You know, three, it was three, four coffee enemas a day, every four hours one, um, the juicing. But you could make the juice like I have thermoses, so I would make it three times a day and have the juice okay. during the course of the day. I couldn't work during that time because I was busy mm -hmm. with all this. Stuff. But I got through that, and it was very helpful because a lot of things happened. I had some candida at the time, a yeast infection, and that cleared up mm -hmm. with the Gerson program. And that was interesting because you know carrots are considered to be sweet. And, and uh, yeah. when I first got to the clinic, I said to the doctor, oh, I, I don't think I can do the program. Meanwhile, I'm already there in Mexico, so I don't know. It was weird. And he said to me, well, this is a hospital. We'll take care of you. Don't worry. And in fact, I started to get better pretty much right away, although it took mm -hmm. a while for it to really work. But, you know, um, that's just one, one program of eating. Almost every uh, alternative-oriented doctor suggests coffee enemas. That's very well thought of because it helps cleanse the liver. Liver is very important, you know. It, the liver processes everything, all the chemicals yeah. in our environment. You know, when I was in Delhi, one of the issues you have is people are burning wood, burning stoves and stuff like that. It's a lot of smell of burning. And some days it's hard to go out because it's such a strong smell. So everybody has to detox from those kinds of things. That's, you know, problematic. And um, But each nation has its own issues. And as we talked about the other day, turmeric, which of course I take every mm. single day, uh, both as the, the spice and as medicine. And that's very important because otherwise I think India would be absolutely overrun with cancer, but you have that natural protection that really helps yeah. and had it from early childhood. I didn't discover Indian food till I was um, 23 years old. Happy day. Wow. <laughs> well, it was a long time ago. You know, I'll be 75 in February, so going, you know, going strong. You know, 1971 till now, it's good. Mm. <laughs> so, I mean, all these things, uh, when you discovered, you started implementing, I mean, the turmeric, the, I, mean, I think garlic and all those things were also included. So, you included all those things in your protocol. 
and that's how you uh, that's you took oh, yeah, it for 18 months and that's how you know it started shrinking and where did the role of uh, the the herbal is that you mentioned i think the chinese medicine uh, when, when did when did that start <clears throat> yeah it, that's i started in april or june may may of 1999 and that was very very okay. helpful and you know i took it for a total of 14 months and then i had to stop he told me i was done MRI oh, said I was okay. okay. Got it. And, Got and it. but Got now, it. since then, I, you know, I took it for, I had some issues with my throat, kind of like, um, hmm. I forgot what they call it, but you know, some, some issues of it pulsating hmm. and I took herbs for that from him. And then hmm. now I take herbs for my lymphoma from him. And uh, hmm. they, they're very impactful. At our conference, we're actually going to honor Dr. George Wong, the herbalist, because he's helped so many people. I know that, um, I mean, I, I know hundreds of people that he's helped. I recommended, you know, at least 70 of them to him. But I mean, one story that was very interesting to me. So again, we're all going to die someday. So there was a gentleman who was the brother of a man I know. And he, he, um, his family brought him to Dr. Wong. He had stage four lung cancer. He'd already been through treatment, uh, conventional treatment. So, you know, he was in pretty bad shape. And Dr. Wang gave him an herbal prescription, which he uh, had for two years. He had no problem breathing for two years, had no, you know, no advance of the disease, but eventually he died. But his family understood that he got two healthy years out of the whole thing, and they were very grateful because he was in a, a difficult situation, but he got two happy and healthy years out of it, which, you know, that's worth everything when you're at the, the end stage and the doctors have given up on you, and then you find something that gives you two good years. It was marvelous. It was beautiful. And everybody in the family was grateful. You know, it's understandable because it's such a yeah. important thing. And, uh, and many, you know, many, many people with stage four have worked with him who are still working with him, still alive. And, you know, again, there's always survivors. You know, we scare people with, oh, no, it's stage four. There's always survivors, always. And, and we don't explore who those people are or what they're doing. But that's what Kelly Turner did with radical remission, questioning people, how did you manage it? And they managed it. She has, I think, 12 themes, maybe. I forget. Mm. Between 7 and 12, something like that. Sorry, bad with that. But, you know, they, she points out these things people have in common. And again, the number one thing is the power of their mind, mind. to say, I put myself in the survivor category, and that's where I live. Mm. 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 So, I mean, so before this, I mean, just, just wanted to know, I mean, what, what exactly is the general mindset of people when it comes to healing cancer naturally? Uh, I mean, how, how does that work? And, you know, it, so why am I asking this is because uh, it, it's already very uncommon there in the US. And in 1993, you went towards healing naturally, which is again very surprising with, you know, with no internet and everything. So how did that work out for you? I mean, where did you get that information and how did you... How were you, uh, you know, how did you find that information in the first place or was there any influence uh, who helped you figure it out? So how did that work out for you? Just, I'm just curious about that. Yeah, so a friend of mine became an acupuncturist and I was able to throw ideas back and forth with her. She told me immediately, um, we can help with stroke. If you ever have a stroke, we're here. You know, acupuncture can really okay. help. So that was good to know. And then I said to her, oh, I'll be your first customer. You know, I, I didn't know anything about acupuncture, but my good friend, Francis, is now an acupuncturist, so I go in, and she does things, and I loved it. I mean, I loved when she put the needle in, and it felt really good right away. I was obviously a candidate for acupuncture, but I didn't know. So at the end of three months, I stopped having menstrual cramps. Now, I didn't have the worst cramps in the universe, but I was uncomfortable every month with kind of a, like a knife feeling in my right ovary. Stopped completely, mm. and it never came back. So that was extraordinary. And I didn't even know she was doing that. And she said, oh, yeah, we're very good with women's issues. I'm like, oh, OK, well, that's cool. <laughs> you know, so but and she also was trying to help me with the constipation. And eventually, you know, and this is probably TMI or what we call too much information. But I was getting like what I call mouse droppings every day, which was a big advance over twice a week. So I was happy, but it wasn't good enough, of course. But she was helping me move along toward better health. And then. I lived in New York City, which is a place of opportunity. And there were various uh, underground information even then. And I somehow connected to it. I don't even remember how, but I, I started seeing 
you could go here, you could try this. And I would meet people. I went to meetings all over the city. I dragged other people with me. I tried to get them on board. So because I was in New York City, there was also a library of um, studies. Yeah. And like I said, I'm very interested in the evidence, even though there's no very strong studies of natural products, natural substances, mm -hmm. because the pharmaceutical industry controls research and they want to patent something. And it, if they take something natural and make it into a drug, it becomes just like all the other drugs, helpful and harmful at the same time. And uh, I often say a pharmaceutical drug to me is like a sledgehammer when you need a gentle tap. Mm. So it's too much in the systems. Because, you know, in the U.S. we have commercial advertising drugs. I don't know if you have that, but our TV programs, and they go down this list of horror stories of problems from the drug that treats your asthma or your psoriasis. But you could get lymphoma or you could, you know, risk of death or tuberculosis. I mean, it's kind of crazy. It's over the top. But they're not interested in natural stuff unless they can do something with it. But I had access because of being in New York City, the major, you know, center of the universe as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. <laughs> New York. We have, by the way, maybe yeah. a thousand Indian restaurants in New York City. So, I mean, we mm. have everything. And I've tried them all. <laughs> I started the, the website in 1999 so I could share the information, yeah. and I was able to do it myself yeah. back then. It eventually got to be 8,000 pages, and it wasn't sustainable, so it had to be redone. So now we have less pages, mm. but we're slowly rebuilding. And I also post a lot on Facebook, so if your audience is on Facebook, we have facebook.com slash Annie Appleseed Project as one I word. I put the links there. And yeah. I put studies there every day. Oh, yeah, good. And every day there's something interesting from one resource or other, uh, you know, it's possible to get summaries. So then I try to summarize the summary so that people can understand it because research is done in a certain language style that's, it, it's mm. dense, you know, it's dense and they dance yeah. around the issue. So I try to cut to it and say, wait, that's, you know, you've got to be, um, you, you can understand it to mean this or that or whatever. And that's helpful to people because everybody wants some evidence. And also you can show it to you, your mainstream doctor if you're working with one. Mm and say, look, here's some information on this, here's some evidence, and you may be able to persuade them to, to go forward. So for me, I used to bring my breast surgeon, who was the only person following me, I used to bring her an article of something, and she would take it and be all excited, and eventually I discovered she was putting it in my file, and I had this huge file on a huge amount of uh, papers. <laughs> she wasn't sharing it. Another thing that happened, for people who do radiation, uh, and I'm sure you have this plant, aloe vera, you have aloe vera plants? Yeah. In India, yeah. So that's yeah. very, very protective on the skin for burns <laughs> and radiation harm. It often includes burns. So in order to protect the skin, you put aloe after the treatment, or you'd have to do it the day before the or the afternoon after or the day after. But it really works. I mean, I actually stupidly, accidentally, got second degree burns all around my face, and as you can see, I don't have any scarring. And um, I immediately went out to my yard and got my aloe plants and did this and that and this and that all over the place. And everything healed up in a few days. So I know for a fact that aloe works for burns. You know, it's interesting. My um, family, like so many other people, my family was split in the middle. Half of them thought, oh, my God, she's killing herself. And the other half were like, oh, this is so great. I'm proud of you. So my father was among the, oh, my God, why are you doing that stuff? And he... <laughs> And I told him that, you know, I use this aloe. And he said to me, oh, I know about aloe for years. I said, Dad, that's considered alternative. Don't you understand? There's a lot of things like that. And he said to me, my golf partner has had breast cancer. She had chemo. She's fine. Why can't you do it? <laughs> um, She's not me. I'm chemically sensitive. My body. Exactly. I mean, here's an example of chemical sensitivity. So when I had the first surgery, I was in the hospital for two nights. That's what they did in the old days. And I didn't sleep at all, not a wink. And I walked around the entire hospital all night long, pushing my pole. I had an IV of some kind, pushing my pole. Second night, same thing. Not one person asked me who I was, what I was doing, how I felt, where was I from, nothing like that. That's one of the advantages that you have in India. People care more in the community of healthcare. Um, there's, there's personalized attention. Nobody even noticed me having two nights of no sleep at all. When I went home, I didn't sleep for four more nights. So that's how my chemically sensitive body received anesthesia. Lucky I was asleep during surgery, honestly. But after that, I never had another surgery with general anesthesia. I only did local. So I had the second two lumpectomies under local, and I had two separate mastectomies under local. 
people say, oh, my God, how'd you do it? But I didn't feel it because, A, you know, actually the breast is the best thing to, to have operated on because it's outside the body. So you're really not, they don't have to break your chest wall to get into your heart or any of that stuff. And, and the local a- anesthesia was just fine for me. I didn't have a problem with that. In general, I didn't want to have. First of all, it robs your brain cells. So if you have, mm. I had seven surgeries, so imagine mm. that. But I had a lot of brain cell death, which I cannot afford, particularly now as I get older. <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> the caring part was missing. And I know plenty of people say their nurses were great, and I'm sure they were. But I didn't have any of that, nothing. You know, I had no personal connection. But then again, I didn't go through treatment regimen that most people don't do, so nobody had time to get to know me whatever it's okay but there's much more caring everywhere else than here we're working on it but it's a slow little project i think in india it's completely different but uh, yeah we are, we are slowly progressing towards the western side of life so okay. you know it's it's somewhat it's ironic because it's it's like a circle we are moving towards the west west is moving towards the east and you know we are trying to adopt things that we that that is very far from us and we are uh, you know one of uh, western is sort of trying to adopt things which are from india and india is not using those things in, the, in its full, full potential so and we are we are you know the cancer rate is increasing at an alarming rate here in india i mean alarming rate and i think it's probably because of the lot of a uh, lot of joints are being opened or a lot of fast food is being served now and everything is fast food past life is you know is a new thing here in india so i think that is uh, again that is very very troubling but you know there are so many takeaways from this video and one of the one of the best thing that i you know found about this conversation is uh, a that you were very persistent with your herbal and natural things i mean not many people do that i mean you, they just give up uh, give up after a while so you were so persistent that i want to heal it uh, using the natural method so that is that is commendable i mean that requires a very firm and a very strong mindset because often times what happens is that people start the treatment and then uh, start the, going towards a natural route and then they uh, you know drop it in between and then they again go back to the conventional route and again go back to the chemotherapy and everything so it requires such a strong mindset with you know your your tumors were recurring but then also you were firm that no i i want to heal your, uh, myself naturally so that is extremely commendable and second point is you know the the part uh, where you mentioned the lymphoma that is again commendable because the mindset that you have right now that i don't care i mean you you just focus on your life and the cancer is will uh, cancer will definitely shrink away so that is again it, it's a really important aspect and a really important mindset to have when it comes to healing because until and unless you have a positive mindset it i think it it won't matter whether you are doing anything right or wrong so mindset is such an important thing here so you said that people uh, get scared and go back to conventional they really need yeah. to co- to combine when they go to conventional, they need to combine some complementary therapies. It will definitely help make it easier to get through despite the treatment. And that's a good goal. Also, I want to say that we have the Anyopathy Project has a YouTube channel where we have some of the talks yeah. from our prior educational conferences uh, on the site, on the channel. Great. And also yeah. some talks that I've given about how to stay calm and how to be focused and how to be, you know, happy. Because uh, that's, in my mind, really important. But yeah, there's... The complementary medicine for people who are going to try conventional, it's extremely important. Yeah. I mean, let's face it, conventional can be very harmful. There's a lot of harms. I mean, it harms the heart. You, know, yeah. you can get neuropathy. You can cause nausea and vomiting, the, the number one stuff. But there's other things, too, and there's weird things that happen. So the more you protect yourself, the better. And there's a list of things on our website. We have a handout on reducing treatment toxicity. Perfect. Yeah, it's very important. And I am I going to have... I put on the links. Yeah. Great. I'll put on the links for all these uh, on my on the description. That's great. I appreciate that, and I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you and your audience. And I'm always available if need be. And I look forward to seeing you at our conference. That will be great. Perfect. And just one last question. I mean, what advice would you like to give someone who is just looking at this video and trying to figure out what his next step should be? Decision making is the hardest part. While you're trying to decide what to do most difficult but once you decide you know go with it with all your heart 
and again, um, combine things, that's your best bet. There's no single magic bullet I wish there was, then we could all do it, but it isn't like that. So you have to do a combination of things. And you, you know, you do what makes you feel good and makes you feel better and makes you feel calm because those are the important things. Combination, it's no single thing. Perfect, perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for doing this. I, this, this was a fantastic story and uh, I'm sure that a lot of people will be inspired by watching this video and a lot of people will, you know, gain a lot of insights. Uh, which uh, you know everyone was looking for and a story you know it's, it, with such an inspiring story with such an inspiring attitude that you have I mean it's commendable I, I love you. talking to you <laughs> <laughs> thanks and definitely well, I'm very I would sincere. love to <laughs> and, I, and definitely I would love to come at the conference and meet you as well in person <laughs> great great thank you I appreciate the opportunity Perfect. bye everybody it was a pleasure bye bye <laughs> thank bye -bye. you so much आई होप दोस्तों आपको ये वीडियो अच्छा लगा होगा अगर आपको ये वीडियो अच्छा लगा तो इस वीडियो को लाइक करें और ज़्यादा से ज़्यादा लोगों तक शेयर ज़रूर करें साथ ही नीचे कमेंट करके अपनी राय बताएं कि आपको इस वीडियो से क्या सीखने को मिला मिलते हैं जल्दी अगले वीडियो में तब तक के लिए कीप सपोर्टिंग स्टे हेल्दी